Welcome to Hearth of Hymonia. My name is Kate. Today we are talking about love magic in ancient Greece and ancient Rome. If you haven't seen my last video about curse tablets, I would highly recommend you watch that one first because I explain what curse tablets are and how they work and I'm gonna be talking a lot about them today. So if you haven't seen that one, I will link it in the description down below. Obviously you don't have to watch it to enjoy this video, but I'd highly recommend it. So we have two main types of sources for love magic in antiquity. The first are literary sources and the second are archeological sources. Now the archeological sources, I'm talking primarily about curse tablets, but I'm also including texts that describe rituals that would have actually been practiced. So for example, we have the Greek magical papyri, which is a huge corpus of magical texts found in Egypt and compiled and published in one nifty little book. If you're interested in this collection, the YouTube channel Esoterica, which is run by Dr. Justin Sledge, has a great video about it, and I will also link that in the description if you wanted to check that out as well. When it comes to literary sources, I'm talking primarily about fiction, although not exclusively. The examples that I cover in today's video will be fictional, and the reason I make this distinction and I don't include the Greek magical papyri in the literary category is that we can assume that people were using the Greek magical papyri more like a cookbook. So we wouldn't count Apicius's Roman cookbook as literature per se, we would count it more on the side of how people actually lived. So that's why I'm putting the Greek magical papyri on the archeological side, but that doesn't mean that all of the literary accounts of love magic are necessarily fictional. Okay, let's get into it. Who practiced love magic? When it comes to studying love magic in the ancient world, and this is true about most academic disciplines, at least in the humanities, a lot of times the scholarship is shaped by the trends of what is popular in modern culture. Love magic is one of those topics that has gone back and forth and back and forth depending on what was trendy or popular at the time. So when it comes to who practiced love magic, there's a lot of different opinions out there. And I'm not saying that I'm infallible, but I'm gonna give you my version of it. Early on, there was an assumption that love magic was only practiced by women. And this was shaped by the fact that we didn't have a lot of archeological evidence at the time. There's been a ton of excavations and we have actually quite a large body of curse tablets. And we have the Greek magical papyri, which have been translated and published Published. So that assumption is largely falling out of fashion now. Back when there was no archeological evidence, the only evidence that scholars could look to was literary evidence. And a lot of literature that includes love magic is about women doing love magic on men. So the assumption was that only women practice love magic. Now, the archeological evidence has shown that that's not true. There were plenty of men that did love magic, just as much as women, actually. And in fact, literary evidence isn't exclusively biased, I guess, towards women practicing magic. The next generation of scholars rejected the notion that only women did love magic, and instead they tried to categorize love magic into like these two gendered categories. Love magic that was done by men or solicited by men was more violent and possessive in nature, but love magic done by women was more getting your cheating husband to stop cheating on you or to have eternal love forever and live happily ever after and die together and all of that good stuff. This type of scholarship feels like it has feminist undertones to me. And that's not why I reject it, obviously, but 
it feels ideologically motivated to me. It's just factually not true, particularly with the archaeological evidence. Everybody did every kind of love magic. Men did love spells to get their girlfriends to stop cheating on them or to make the one that they are so in love with fall back in love with them. And women did magic to harm men that wronged them in love in some way, and they did magic to possess men. Don't even get me started on the fact that there are love spells cast by men on men and cast by women on women. To put these things into categories by gender is fundamentally a misstep because in the world of love and sex, everybody is different. So just because someone's a man doesn't mean that they're gonna be violent and possessive. Just because someone's a woman doesn't mean she's gonna be naive and romantic and only do love spells for a happily ever after. That's just not how it works. So I think my approach is typically to avoid categorization altogether and to say that everybody did love magic. It's not specific to any one group of people. So you've heard the phrase, love is a battlefield. Uh, that's not a new invention. This notion existed far before the 80s. Love and war in poetry in general, in particular in Roman love poetry, which is what I sort of know more about, love and war are pretty much always paired together. So if you're talking about a battle or a warrior, you might talk about their love of battle and it's described in romantic terms. On the flip side of the coin, love is described as painful and like a battle, essentially. You are fighting not just with rivals, but you're fighting with your partner because it's you're in pain, they're in pain, everything is painful and toxic and weird. So it doesn't really surprise me that a lot of particularly cursed tablets that have to do with romantic contexts are very violent in nature. I curse so-and-so, I bind them to love me and only me, and may their insides burn in an eternal fire until they come to me. I think nowadays we would look at something like that and say that is not a healthy form of love, but it is typical for the time period. It's corroborated by literary evidence. I mean, love was compared to madness. Eros, the sort of primordial god of, I, I guess, like lust maybe, but like primal biological lust. This god Eros was described as being, as, as being able to like inflict madness on people. I mean, I know we have Hallmark cards today where like little cute baby Cupid with his cute little baby bow and arrow, but the way that you fall in love in ancient mythology is you literally get struck by an arrow. It doesn't surprise me that these cursed tablets were violent, but it doesn't make me feel any better about it either. You know, wishing eternal torment on someone until they sleep with you and then the torment goes away after they've slept with you is, in my view, not a great way to start a relationship. But, you know, that's just me. It's a sign that when you're cursing someone to fall in love with you, you yourself are having all of these horrible feelings and you want that person to want you back. So you want them to have the same horrible feelings that you're having. It's a weird psychological game. I can conceptualize how that would be the case, but I, I just don't like it. <laughs> I don't think anybody likes it. I wanna talk for a minute about like the actual practical aspect of this and why this might be the case. Typically when we talk about love magic and curse tablets, the focus is on violence and hatred and misogyny and all of these sort of negative like you you want to possess the person you hate the person and you have this weird like incel type fantasy going on and there's plenty of literature out there if that's the topic that you want to read up on but i want to talk about the logistics of why you would want that person to suffer in this way and i'm not saying that i approve of it, I'm not saying that I agree with it, but from a logistics standpoint, imagine you have a crush on someone 
And it's so upsetting, it's so painful. Every time you look at them, you just want to be with them, you want to say something to them, but you can't. It's very uncomfortable. It can be very overwhelming, you want to cry about it, it might present as physical pain in your body, right? But now imagine that that person tells you that they like you back. All of a sudden the pain goes away. Whatever your relationship is like, it might be a painful relationship, but that, that pain of the unrequitedness of the love that you feel towards them or the love that you feel towards them goes away when you realize that your affections are returned. You want that person to feel the same kind of unrequited love that you feel and then you come together and the pain goes away for everybody. I think this is how cursed tablets in romantic contexts worked. Again, I don't love it, but by trying to put this curse on the person and you're like describing the symptoms of eros, of mad unrequited love, you're basically saying, I want this person to be as madly in love with me as I am with them. There's also an element of catharsis where if you're like madly in love with somebody, you know, you're you are suffering for it and you want to alleviate your suffering, maybe you'll write that letter. And it doesn't matter whether you send it or not. It doesn't matter whether the person ever actually receives the letter. It's cathartic for you to get it all out of your system. So I think there's also that element, I'm not alone in this, I know I've read people that have said this before as well. It's a way of coping with the madness of Eros. It's a way of dealing with the fact that you're experiencing this kind of psychological and maybe even physical torment. And when you describe, I want the person's breath to shorten, I want the person to feel like their limbs are on fire, you're describing your own symptoms. By wishing it on the other person, you're like, I want that person to feel it back so that we can get together and I also want to like get this out of my system somehow. Now that doesn't change the fact that this is not a good way to do things and it's one thing to write all this down, it's another thing to feel like you are entitled to that person and how you choose to act based on that assumption that you're entitled to them, that doesn't always go well. If you're feeling uncomfortable, you'll be thrilled to know that I'm about to talk about the love magic debate in modern witchcraft because it is a hot topic among all sorts of different traditions of witches and pagans operating in the modern world. In Harry Potter's sixth year at Hogwarts, he is the intended target of a love spell that goes awry and ends up cursing his friend Ron to be madly in love with a girl named Romilda Vane. It's written kind of funny, but the reality is at the end of the day, he's been poisoned. He's been like magically poisoned and he can't stop thinking about her it has negative consequences for him. If it had reached its intended target, then Harry would be in that situation. Because he is the intended target, then he would maybe be in a relationship with someone that he wouldn't want to be in a relationship with if he weren't under the influence of these drugs, essentially. Lots of people fight over this on witchcraft forums and on the internet. The issue comes down to compulsion versus free will. Do you really want to be in a relationship with someone who wouldn't choose you if they could choose someone else? That's typically how the debate goes. And the people having these discussions bring in their own set of magical ethics codes. Now, the problem, of course, is that witchcraft is a very diverse community. So there's lots of different magical ethics codes that are competing for, you know, because the, the argument for love magic is it doesn't matter what I do. There's no such thing as the threefold law where everything I put out into the universe will come back to me three times. I don't believe in karma. I don't believe in the afterlife. I'm just gonna do whatever I want, right? And there's the logistical arguments of, well, I'm not actually compelling them. I'm suggesting or, you know, whatever. Right? And then there's the people who say, no, it's morally wrong, it's terrible, you're hurting them and you know, you're know you like roofing them, therefore it should be avoided at all costs. So I'm not here to resolve the debate, but it is a hot topic. I can't say for sure 
that most people reject or accept love magic, I think it's a pretty even split. And I say that because the impulse for love and sex is a human biological impulse that almost everybody feels and understands to some degree. Therefore, there's always going to be a demand for love because for every Wiccan that says that love magic is morally wrong, someone else is getting contacted by a client to do a love spell for them. So I think that both camps are well stacked and I think this debate is going to go on forever. Um, I don't think that there's going to be one side that wins out. Some people try to compromise and say, well, it's morally wrong to do a love spell on someone and I won't do it, or I, I won't support anyone who does this kind of work, but you can do love spells as long as they're not for particular people. So you could say instead of, you know, I want Mike to fall in love with me, you can say, I'm doing a spell to attract a partner, or I'm doing a spell to, you know, create the conditions for an ideal match to come into my life, or I'm doing a self-love ritual, or I'm doing a friendship ritual. And then obviously like there's love magic with like two consenting partners who both know that the spell is happening and that's a different thing, but there are workarounds for people who want to attract someone, but they don't want to compel someone to fall in love with them. Lots of different things going on in the world of modern love magic, but in the ancient world, I think it was more straightforward almost. The situations obviously were different. We get love spells of courtesans like cursing each other because like they want to steal their clients. So the topics of love magic are I mean, each situation is different. Typically the curse tablet evidence that we have is more along the lines of cursing, binding, compelling the person to do whatever it is that you want them to do. And maybe that is sleep with you, maybe that is marry you, maybe that is leave you, their husband. The literary sources for love magic, I find tend to be, I don't want to say unrealistic. So in Theocritus' second idyll, he writes about this woman, Samitha, who does a love spell to bring this guy, Daphnis, back to her. Daphnis has found someone else and she's heartbroken, so she wants to bring him back. But the problem is Theocritus is writing love magic at the same time that Apollonius of Rhodes is writing love magic and he's writing about Medea. They're constructing their stories basically to say, the other guy got it wrong, this is how it happens. So to me, that says that that's not an accurate representation of what happened. If we are going to use it for evidence of what a girl might do if her boyfriend leaves her, I don't know that we can trust what Theocritus says knowing that he's trying to argue with Apollonius. And then there's, Horace's Canidia. If I look miserable, it's because I just don't, I don't care <laughs> about Horace's Canidia. I'm sorry, I don't. She's a wannabe witch. She does all of these spells and they don't work. And Horace writes all about how she doesn't know what she's doing. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Ha ha, let's make fun of her. By the way, in this one particular spell, she buried a child, she kidnapped a child buried him alive, waited for him to die of starvation so that she could harvest his organs to bring her lover or the guy that she wants to be in a relationship with back to her. It just has no bearing on anything. I've never seen any other evidence that human sacrifice, such brutal torture, of a child in a human sacrifice and using human body parts to do a love spell. Like there's no other evidence for that from the ancient world as far as I can tell. I would love for someone to help me out here if you do have evidence of it, but it's just so over the top that like, it's exhausting. <laughs> I just don't care. I'm sorry, like it's not real. It has nothing to do with anything. Horace is just salty and I say this 
I love Horace. I do. But he's just salty. I read a great paper a few years ago that said that maybe Canidia was Horace's ex-girlfriend and so he was writing slander of her. Now that's something I think is funny and worth talking about. That's what we have for literary evidence is stuff like that. So that's why I don't want to spend that much time on it because it just doesn't... It's, come on, come on. In conclusion, I don't like love magic. <laughs> um, I don't like talking about it because it's very dreary to me. It's very like bleak. It gives off incel energy and also feels like a waste of time. And then if it actually works, now you've got someone who's been roofied like hanging out with you. It just feels like a lot of effort when you could just like talk to the person, flirt with them, I don't know. I don't like it, but just because I don't like it doesn't mean that it didn't happen, doesn't mean that it's not real. It certainly existed in the ancient world, and in fact, it's one of the most common applications of magic in ancient Greece and ancient Rome. So my personal feelings aside, it is something that we absolutely need to talk about if we're going to be thinking about the ancient world. It was practiced by all genders, sexual orientations, irrespective of class, it's a major part of the magical landscape of the ancient world. Certainly worth talking about even if I don't personally want to think about it too much because it just drives me a little crazy. So that's all I have for you today. I hope you liked this video. If you did, you can let me know by giving it a thumbs up. If you want to see more content like this, Go ahead and subscribe because I am going to be posting more videos about magic in the ancient world, although probably not too many about love magic. But yeah, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it and I will see you in the next video.